All right, hello everyone. We will just give everyone a few minutes to log on. Um, and while we do that, I'm going to go through a few controls uh, to this AirMeet platform. It might be new for some of you who are here today. So we'll, we'll do that here. Um, so there is at the bottom of your screen, a little um, face a button it has a, a smiley face and feel free to use that to share any emojis and I'd like to use this as a test just to make sure that everyone can hear me they can see me they can see the the presentation so feel free to to share a, a thumbs up or a heart or anything like that okay I see some coming through that's great oh wonderful we have some some people online that's great and um, so for, for this platform here, there's a few different buttons that you might want to use to engage with uh, us and the speaker today. There is on the right side of your screen, a button that is for chat. So feel free to, to type in the chat if you'd like to share any comments, if you'd like to interact with anyone. And right next to that is a Q&A button. So we will be setting aside time at the end of the presentation to do questions and answers. And I encourage you to type your questions and answers in at any time throughout the presentation, just so you don't forget to ask them. But we will be setting aside that time uh, at the end to go through them. So to test out the chat feature, how about we do some introductions? So um, I'm, a, I'm a guessing that we have a number of people who are joining from different places in Ontario, but maybe outside of Ontario as well. So feel free to say hello share where you're joining us from, uh, maybe share the organization you're representing or why you are joining this webinar today with us. And I suppose I should also introduce myself at this point as well. <laughs> My name is Victoria and I am the Habitat Program Manager for our Rights of Way program here at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. So if, yeah, like I said, feel free just to, to type in the chat to say hello if at any time you're having any difficulties with um, anything technical with Aramie, you can also send me a direct message and I'm happy to help you along as best as I can. So I, for one, am joining here from our head office, uh, which is located in Ottawa. And um, I also want to acknowledge the, the traditional Indigenous territories from which we're, we're all joining today um, as we're on the select electronic medium. So here in the nation's capital in Ottawa, we are on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabek Nation. So if you don't know which land that you're joining from us today, I encourage you to take some time at the end of the webinar to, to um, research that. And during our presentation, um, really reflect on our relationship with uh, Indigenous peoples and how that relates to not just the land we work on, but also the seeds that we use in our work. And I see some, some introductions coming in. Hello to uh, Brian, to Barb. We have um, some joining from, let's see, Saskatoon. So definitely outside of Ontario there. And uh, continue, continue uh, introducing yourselves um, as I just move forward. So some of you, this might be your first introduction to the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, so I'll just do a, a little introduction to that. So CWF is one of Canada's largest conservation organizations, and we have a number um, of projects that take place across the country. So we have uh, education programs where we engage the public um, and youth in citizen science. We also have specific conservation for um, projects like in uh, marine or freshwater programs and those that are targeted to a specific species at risk, such as the right whale, or just like our project today um, that we'll be talking more about for Rights of Way, which was inspired by the monarch butterfly. So this project here, um, we work collaboratively with land managers to restore the um, breeding and nectaring habitat um, along the migratory route for the monarch butterfly, but also other uh, pollinator species, other benefiting pollinators. And we do this with land managers on rights of way. So that includes um, land managers for uh, roadsides, for hydro corridors, solar, even pipeline easements. And this is our team here. And you might recognize some of these faces. Maybe you've seen mine a few times. Um, if you were able to join us on our first uh, webinar from this series, you'll recognize Tracy's face. And um, you'll also meet the, the rest of the team uh, throughout this series as well. 
So with this project, we have built and are continuing to grow uh, networks of rights of way managers. So one network is our Canadian chapter of the rights of way as habitat working group. And this is our national chapter. So from wherever you are in Canada, you are welcome to join. We also have a new LinkedIn group and I'll share that link in the chat um, shortly. If you would like to join that way and connect with other rights of way managers to ask questions, to get first notice about um, our training opportunities, just like this today. We also have two regional chapters, one in Eastern Ontario and one in Southwestern Ontario. And um, in both of those two areas, we are also working on the ground with rights of way managers for pollinator habitat restoration, both active and passive restoration. We provide funding, but also support in doing so. And we also facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing opportunities, just like webinars like this, our annual workshop, but also in-person opportunities. And if you're in Eastern Ontario, stay tuned for a save the date for an in-person opportunity that'll be taking place at the end of August. And as I mentioned, this webinar is number two on a three-part series taking place this spring and summer. Uh, so the first, like I said, Tracy was our speaker, and um, she walked us through the 2021 pollinator monitoring results in Eastern Ontario. Of course, we have today, and I'll do that introduction in just a moment. And we also have our next webinar taking place on July 13th um, with our, our own um, Vincent Fison, our GS analyst, on geospatial tools to aid in the restoration of rights of way. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, um, Stefan Weber. So Stefan Weber is a botanist who specializes in native seed and community dynamics. He has received his Master's of Science in Biology from the University of Guelph, studying plant, um, plant pollinator interactions. And he also has received his PhD in biology from McMaster University studying applied ecology. And Stefan has experienced growing commercial wildflower seed, prescribing seed mixes, as well as implementing and assessing um, uh, seed-based habitat restoration projects. He has worked with St. William's Nursery, the Toronto Botanical Garden, and Carolinia in Canada, and I'm sure you've heard of uh, those, those groups. And um, as the founder of Ontario Plant uh, Restoration Alliance, he has also partnered with conservation agencies across southern Ontario to restore wild seed sources. So I will pass things on to Stefan. And um, please just bear with me as I exit, start sharing my screen when <laughs> we get Stefan's loaded up. All this technical stuff always takes a little bit of time. I'm glad things are working for you, Stefan. Oh, perfect. We can see it. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, thank you to everyone who's uh, joining us today. I'm very excited to be talking to you about designing site-specific seed mixes for the Southern Ontario landscape. Um, I have previously worked as a restoration ecologist with the St. Williams Nursery, and I spent a number of years both growing wildflower seed for large-scale restoration, as well as coming up with mixes and prescribing seed to different projects. Um, so this is also something that I've had the great opportunity to study and uh, I'd like to share some of what I have learned over the past about 10 years in working with bulk native wildflower seeds. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to summarize a lot of uh, this knowledge that I and other people have gathered over the years into a handy decision-making tool. Um, Canadian Wildlife Federation approached me about this project a few months ago, um, and we've been designing what we call a seed calculator. So this is a pretty simple Excel file that takes you through some of the decision-making when it comes to designing a seed mix for uh, large-scale direct seeded restoration. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the background of this calculator project. Um, we're gonna talk about the different components of that calculator, get into the nitty gritty in terms of the decisions that you need to make and um, you know, why certain limitations or barriers exist. Uh, we will uh, go through a, a few examples, maybe just a, one or two quick examples that I can come up with. If you want to see things kind of played out in the calculator, we'll, we'll switch out of this program into Excel and we'll do a bit of a live test run of the calculator. Uh, and then there'll be time for questions and feedback. Um, I'm really 
I guess both looking to, to share this information um, and a, a really early pilot version of the calculator with you, but I'm also really interested to hear your feedback and to um, get any suggestions on how we could improve um, the calculator. So um, we really kind of vision this as a, a, a tool for um, applied restoration folks in terms of prescribing seed to different types of projects and ordering that seed um, early on in the in the project's uh, life cycle. So the calculator itself can help you specify appropriate native seed mixes for your project in terms of species that are actually native to Southern Ontario to different ecozones. It can help you estimate the total amount of seed that is required based on the density of uh, seeds per meter that you'd like to see. This can, in a very loose way, help you estimate a budget for your seed mix um, based on both the weight per kilogram of seed mix, but also based on your project size, um, number of hectares that you're restoring. Um, and we've include, included um, aspects of two different approaches to estimating seed mixes, both a seeds per meter um, sort of seedling density approach and also a kilograms of seed mix, sort of a, a seed mass approach to um, coming up with your total seeding rates. Um, and overall, we hope that this will not only be a useful tool, um, but this will help all different sorts of seed users operate at a regional level and pool their demand so that we can better inform our native seed supply industry and they can have a, kind of a clearer picture of the different species and the different mixes that are going to be in the demand, in demand down the pipeline uh, years to come. So um, like I said, this is sort of version one pilot that we're talking about with you today, um, but there's some pre-existing information that went into this calculator. Uh, it relies heavily upon um, seeds per gram, so how many seeds per gram, and this is data that we used that is available publicly online from the Prairie Moon Nursery. There are other sources that provide this information, but for consistency we stuck with Prairie Moon. We've converted this to um, seeds per gram from seeds per ounce reported on the website. We've consulted a number of different plant lists, including um, my favorite plants of the Carolinian zone by Mike Oldham. Uh, also, a number of the plants that are found in grassland habitats are actually rare in Southern Ontario. So cross-referenced a number of these with the rare plant atlas. Um, also, uh, because we, we try to talk about mixes that would be appropriate up into the Ottawa Valley region, um, I did consult with Flora of Lanark County. Um, we also have a number of personal records and field notes from the Oak Ridges Moraine, uh, plant lists from the Rice Lake Plains, and I've consulted with uh, a handful of experts on which species would be appropriate in different regions. So that aside, we will be talking about different uh, rates, seeding rates, and how to come up with these seeding rates. And like I said, uh, different sources, different experts like to use different approaches. Some will use a seed density approach. Some will use a seed weight approach. Um, and we'll get into kind of uh, the, the reason for such a, a range. But typically, you're looking at about 100 to 500 seeds per meter or something like seven to 15 kilograms per hectare. And there's also this term that I've used, maybe it's not the best term, but production rank. Um, and this is really to help folks understand which species are generally going to be most likely available, most readily available uh, because of all kinds of factors that we're gonna go into. But production rank simply means how easy are they to produce and how likely is it that you might actually be able to purchase larger quantities of these seeds for uh, restoration. And uh, just before we move on, I want to end with one of my favorite quotes that I, I dug up doing my literature review for my PhD work. 
even for the most seasoned restoration professional, revegetation professional, achieving success is not guaranteed. And we will maybe touch on that a little bit at the end. So I kind of want to orient you to what the calculator actually looks like. Again, it's a very simple Excel spreadsheet. I am not a computer programmer. I am not very techy at all. Um, but you know, hopefully if you have some basic Excel spreadsheet skills, this will be easy enough for you to use, uh, modify, you know, personalize, change as you see fit. Uh, really, I vision this as a sort of a template, um, sort of a um, scaffolding to uh, what you might be able to, to do and, and what you might be able to tailor for your own projects on the ground. So uh, like I mentioned, key term here is production rank. I'll start from the left to the right. And this is simply, uh, from my perspective, a ranking of what's most likely to be available and what you really should be basing the bulk of your mix around. And number one is most readily available. And I've ranked um, all 115 species from one to four. OK. Um, and again, we'll do a test run of the actual calculator towards the end. Um, this whole calculator is framed as one long big species list. So you can sort by common name, by scientific name. I've also tried to uh, sort of prescribe a plant type or habitat type to different species. And this is in my experience. Um, you can definitely use this tool and um, make it more specific, more general that's up to you. Um, and then also I've tried to include a bit of a descriptor here about the seeds themselves, because as you probably know, plant seeds come in all different shapes and sizes and have all different kinds of um, sort of natural history requirements and, and life cycle requirements. And this can affect um, how you put your mix together and literally which seeds you put in the same bag. Um, so the seed type really describes kind of the size of the seed, but also if that seed has what we call extra floral appendages. Um, so coarse seed, fluffy seed may have um, extra bits in addition to the live seed itself. And again, we'll get into that, um, but this is just an overview of what the file looks like, what the calculator looks like. So this is the background information, and this is the actual number crunching calculator part. And it's all in the same spreadsheet. I've just divided it into two. And there's only two columns that you really need to input any kind of information into, and this is uh, user's choice. Um, so the first is the total rate, and this is, pardon me, and that is a rate specified in density, so number of seeds per meter. OK, and then the other is your custom proportion. So of those seeds per meter, what percentage of each species would you like to see in that assemblage that gets mixed and hits the ground? So those are the only two columns that you really need to provide input on. Um, this will calculate um, uh, the rest of the calculator. So this is all set up like in a Excel spreadsheet with formulas, and this will all calculate for itself. The only thing you need to make sure is that uh, the sum of this column here, kilograms per hectare, um, the sum, the bottom of that column, is represented totally in this column, in the total kilograms per hectare. And we'll get to that uh, when we do the example run through. You just need to double check that that's uh, the sum of this equals everything that's uh, every cell in this column. But the only two columns that you really need to manipulate and provide input on is your desired rate and the proportion of species you want to see in the mix. Um, so I won't go through all of these columns, but it does provide you with an estimated cost per hectare and an estimated cost per kilogram. And it will also provide a bit of what I call a recipe, which is really handy for the actual actual supplier, the person that is putting together your mix so that they can see how many grams per kilogram are allocated um, to each species, which um, because of seed size and uh, you know variation between species does not correlate directly with the custom proportion that you want to, want to see in terms of actual number and density of species on the ground. 
Okay, so we will go through the components. That's just a really quick overview of what the calculator looks like. So I want to really dive in now to some of the seed sizes and seed types. And this is really important um, because it will affect how evenly your seed mix is spread. It will also really impact the price of your seed mix, the cost of your seed mix. Okay, so um, there are seeds that are uh, very small and seeds that are quite large. Um, some of the smallest seeds that are, red, that are often used in restoration include things like lobelia, cardinal flower, monkey flower, and these have seeds that are virtually dust. It's, it's very, very, very small. Um, you know, on average about 12,000 seeds per gram. Um, some rushes can also have, soft stemmed rush, can have really dust-like seeds. So that's super fine. Most of our wildflowers, I would say, the vast majority are going to have small, maybe large, everywhere in between, um, small, hard, simple seeds. So these are smooth, usually kind of rounded. They are still quite small. You're getting, on average, about 3,000 seeds per gram. Um, and so this would include things like brown-eyed Susan, Virginia mountain mint, wild bergamot. Uh, one step kind of up from there, and of course there is a spectrum from small to large, but you get things that are typically um, have thicker seed walls, thicker shells around them, and tend to be kind of flat. Um, and these I call large seeds, so lupins, um, milkweeds. Extra large seeds could be things like shrubs, once in a while, um, shrub seeds get specified into grassland and open habitat type um, seed mixes. So, um, so those are kind of the size comparisons. Some seed is also described as coarse. I would use the word coarse because it contains a lot of additional extra floral appendages is, is sort of the technical term. Um, but Usually this is grasses, and these parts include the awns, the palea and lemma, which are like the little scale bracts around the seeds. So kind of like the husk of the seed. And it's not always easy or possible to remove these parts fully from the seeds without damaging the seeds. So often a seed provider will provide you those seeds in a kind of coarse, rough um, format. And this is very important because they do not mix well with the small, fine, and even the large seeds that are not coarse, um, simply because they have a strange shape um, and they take up a lot of volume. So if you have a, if you mix your coarse seed and your fine, small, and large seed in the same bag, um, all of the coarse seed will sort of rise to the top and the rest will settle to the bottom. So it can impact how your seeds get mixed. Um, similar with fluffy seed, I call it fluffy because it's just that's what people call it often. It's uh, usually the seed of asters, goldenrods, sometimes like little blue stem could be fluffy. And again, these are uh, parts of the seed that are not live. Um, they're sort of inert material, but they're still connected to the seed and can be difficult to remove. So often the product that you're purchasing contains all these extra floral bits. And in the cases, case of asters and goldenrods, they tend to be kind of fluffy. Um, so it uh, again doesn't really mix well with the rest of your uh, the rest of your small hard seeds, and usually the coarse and fluffy seeds are mixed separately from the rest of the seeds. This is to help you mix or to spread them evenly in your restoration site, um, but also if you're using something like a drop seeder um, or a drill, you might have different bins that you can put different seed components into that will um, be planted at different rates. Um, okay, so, and um, yeah, okay, next slide. So probably one of one of your major questions is about um, how did you pick the species and where where does this list of species come from? and what affects the production rank and how do different species get ranked differently in terms of their production. So I'll start with the species pool. Um, all species in this list are native plants found in southern Ontario. Um, even though some of them might be regionally rare or otherwise uncommon in the province. 
most of them are early successional community or from early successional communities um, and they do require some element of intermediate disturbance in order to thrive long term but this makes them really appropriate for stressed out you know roadside sites or um, construction footprint restoration and it tends to be grassland savanna meadow type species um, in very dry areas you might want to prescribe what I will call alvar specialists or sand specialists, plants that are adapted already to really dry um, soils, well-drained in the case of sand, um, but seasonally wet, perhaps otherwise very dry in the case of alvar. And a number of the plants that are usually specified in not just roadside mixes, but uh, pollinator grassland style mixes are species that are found predominantly in the tall grass prairie ecoregions of Ontario. And like I said, can be quite restricted and rare on the habit, on the landscape. And that's only because these habitats are um, rare habitats uh, globally, but also in Ontario. And also the fact that Southwestern Ontario is the most highly colonized, highly fragmented and developed part of the country. So that should not deter you from using these plants in, in seed mixes. Like I said, they're often the best adapted to early successional and stressful environments. In wetter areas, um, some of the plants that are, are, are specified often come from maybe a marsh edge or a wet meadow uh, leading into sort of a floodplain. And um, in, in a lot of ways, wetland plants are more difficult to grow as bulk seed species. Not all. If you have a damp enough field, you can grow some wetland plant, wetland edge plants fairly well. Um, so the the list of species that we have does lean on the on the dry side simply because those species are generally more easy to produce and they're more readily available. Um, so we've included uh, about 115, 112 species, and that includes a wide range of functional groups. Um, I just wanted to note that when you're putting your own kind of custom mixes together, it's really important to balance out different functional groups. You want fast growing annuals and biennials. You want longer um, lived, slower growing perennial plants. You want them to be forbs and grasses. It's probably, you know, smart to choose a couple legumes as well to help fix nitrogen um, but just make sure that you've got a balance of, of different functional groups in your mix and so some of the characteristics of different species and their seeds that makes them more or less um, um, easy to use we'll, we'll, we'll go through these characteristics um, so these will define their production rank First and probably most important, the seeds that are used most often in bulk restoration is that are seeds that are um, orthodox, orthodox in their germination and in their dormancy, um, meaning that these are seeds that can be collected, they can be dried at room temperature, they can be stored pretty much long term at you know under cold and dry conditions, and they can be um, sort of sown in spring and germinate pretty readily pretty quickly with just a bit of moisture and sunlight so um, these seeds are the are the ones that are easiest to work with they provide um, green cover quickly um, and they're also easy to store so if you're thinking about um, a seed producer and how they actually farm this material storage is a really important uh, part of that. So being able to store dry and cold long term is really important for the business. Um, also, it's important that a plant actually be what I'm going to call agronomically scalable. So often um, I've seen mixes that request all kinds of different species, um, things like blue-eyed grass. And the reason that blue-eyed grass is not really available um, in the tens and, and dozens of kilograms at a time is because um, it's very difficult to scale up 
blue-eyed grass on a farm um, and then also harvest it in a way that makes sense from a business perspective. Um, so because it's very tiny and it doesn't actually produce a whole lot of seed per individual plant. So you would require a whole lot of space and a whole lot of time to maintain a crop of blue-eyed grass just to get you know, a, a kilogram of, of seed. So um, it's not all plants produce a lot of seed per uh, unit area that they are farmed. And so those plants tend not to be available in bulk quantities for this kind of large scale restoration. And related to this is how easy they are to harvest. So I mentioned, you know, some plants don't produce a lot of seed per plant, but also other plants are just really, really time consuming to harvest, to harvest without getting weed seeds entangled, um, and then to clean that seed. Um, some seed is very easy to clean. For example, um, hairy beard tongue is pretty easy to clean. Um, some things like milkweed or New Jersey tea can have a few other steps involved and sometimes require specialized equipment um, to process that much seed, uh, so bulk, bulk quantities of seed. So ease of cleaning uh, really does limit your species pool a bit. And, uh, you know, this also assumes that we have a sufficient and sustainable um, amount of source material to work with. So at the uh, business I worked with, the St. Williams Nursery and Ecology Center, all of the seed crops were derived from local populations um, in which people went out and over three or five years, seed was collected and every seed was grown given the best chance at surviving that we could give it. And those plants were farmed out to grow a seed orchard or a um, seed production area in order to provide that bulk material. So it can take a few years to get enough seed and to scale up in, uh, to the point where you're providing, like I said, tens or dozens of kilograms at a time. Um, and I think I already mentioned this, but the species that are worked, that are, that are used most often are reliable germinators. They're fast germinators and um, they're also fast growers because a lot of these projects require either some element of erosion control or green and stable conditions or otherwise need to be able to outcompete the weeds that will inevitably show up along with your site. Um, and so if you're, if you're familiar with the concept of conservatism uh, uh, and the, the coefficient of conservatism, this is a ranking that um, describes how specialized a species is to one particular habitat. And so we tend to use species that have a really um, low coefficient of conservatism, meaning that they'll grow in a large variety of different habitats with slightly different growing conditions, soil types, um, and in, in different parts of the province. So yeah, you wanna look for for plants that have low um, coefficients of conservatism. And this is uh, something, a document that is available. I can provide the links in, in a follow-up. So th this is just a, a photo of one of the fields at the St. Williams Nursery production area. Uh, they have, I think, over 90 acres in seed production area, but it literally is a farm um, in order to provide bulk quantities of seed for large-scale restoration. It needs to be farmed agronomically, um, and that this means dense organized plantings that are maintained, um, but it also serves as an amazing restoration and habitat. Okay, um, so I want to talk about sort of ecoregions and reference communities a little bit, and this is the part of the calculator that really um, does need a lot of feedback from practitioners all over Southern Ontario. I'm here in Niagara. I have experience working in Hamilton, Norfolk, a little around the GTA, um, but I have less experience, you know, in other eco regions. And so I'd, I'd love to hear from um, folks that are working in these other regions uh, with regards to how we 
specify seed mixes across southern Ontario because we have such diverse uh, habitats from Windsor all the way up to Ottawa. So um, in the in the pilot draft calculator, I've proposed six different regional mixes um, that are based on ecozones. Um, so the first would be um, around we'll call the, the London London region. I've I've called it the Thames Grand Bend region. So this is seven uh, e two. Um, 7E1 is the Windsor-Essex region, the, the deep south of the Carolinian. Uh, the region I'm most familiar with would be the GTHA, Haldeman-Norfolk-Niagara, uh, this region here. Also, I've lumped a couple ecoregions in together to call it the Wellington-Huron-Perth, 6E5, 6E1. Simcoe, Kawartha, Rice Lake Plains. I'm really not confident in the, in the boundaries and the lumpings of these ecoregions, um, but I'm going to put this out just as some proposed groupings. I'd love to get your feedback on it. Um, and of course, uh, a, a seed mix tailored specifically for the Ottawa region and eastern, eastern Ontario. Pardon me. Um, so again, I can't say it enough. M most of these grassland mixes, pollinator, corridor seed mixes are based on prairie communities and other rare grassland communities. So prairies are rare almost everywhere. Alvars are rare almost everywhere. And something that can often get in the way of specifying diverse seed mixes is um, different regional um, protocols um, or, or restrictions on planting regionally rare and otherwise provincially uncommon species. So um, I would, you know, just remind everyone that these habitats are inherently rare and that if you are planting a seed mix from a known local Southern Ontario seed source, you are in fact helping out these rare plant populations by allowing them to migrate in this super fragmented landscape um, and that if you can keep track of the seed sources in your restoration planning and in, in the project history then that's really valuable data that can inform future practitioners and these restored sites can actually be seed sources in the future uh, for additional ongoing restoration projects so don't shy away from regionally rare things as long as you know where they are coming from um, Okay, I will also just mention that uh, in Southern Ontario, again, where our landscape is highly fragmented, um, mixing different sources is actually considered best practice by a lot of um, folks. And there's a number of studies that support this kind of work. This supports both what we'll call assisted, assisted migration, but also it maintains genetic diversity in that it, it kind of mimics a large scale natural migration event, which will take in nature um, hundreds of years, if not longer, but it will speed up this process and provide restored populations that are more adaptable and more robust to future changes because of that genetic diversity. Um, okay. Seeding rate is another big part of this. How do you decide on your seeding rate? I told you there are sort of two columns that you really get to choose your own adventure. This is one of them, um, seeding rate. So you can find a variety of different resources, online, academic, and non-academic resources that provide different recommended rates, both in terms of number of seed per meter, but also kilograms per hectare. So we'll just go through this a little bit, hopefully um, help you make an informed decision. So on the low end, folks will recommend about 100 seeds per meter. On the high end, I'm seeing about 500 seeds per meter and really anywhere in between. And I think the, the biggest thing that will impact your choice here is the handling method or the seeding method that you have to use or that you've, you've chosen for your project. And this is because different handling methods um, use seed 
in, in different ways. Um, so mechanical seeding uses different methods to apply that seed on the landscape. And these methods um, can be different in their efficiency in how that seed is actually spread. Okay, so um, different options for, for seed sowing. You can, of course, sow by hand. You can sow small areas by hand. You can sow large areas by hand. The largest I've done is a 13 hectare restoration with a group of about 10 people and it took about a day. And you walk in a line and you toss seed. Um, that is one method. You can also, that's sort of hand broadcasting. You can also mechanically broad, broadcast or drop seed. Uh, similar methods in which the seed is scattered loosely on the surface of the soil. Um, some different um, pieces of machinery have different bins, so your seed can drop out at different rates. And again, this is where the seed size and seed type comes into play because your coarse seed you'd want to put in a different bin than your fine wildflower seed and set them to different rates. And the rate that you set it to will be specific to the machine and the operator will know best. There's also a seed drill, which is uh, the, the picture up in the top right hand corner there. Uh, and this makes a little furrow, uh, lines of, uh, of furrows, just disturbs the soil, opens it up and then plants a thin line in that furrow and then covers it back up. And uh, that is a great option. Um, some people say that that's the best option. In my experience, it can on loose soil plant the seed a bit too deep. So do a couple test runs and make sure um, when you're drill seeding that the seed is not planted too deep. A lot of wildflower seeds need light to germinate and the smaller the seed, uh, the closer to the surface it needs to be. Um, asters, goldenrods, even bergamot do best sown right on the surface of the soil. So drill is not always the best option. And then the fourth option, I guess, is the um, hydro seed. So this is a really common way that roadsides in particular and other kind of infrastructure corridors are revegetated is by sort of shooting <laughs> through a giant hose, a slurry of uh, paper mulch, uh, a mulch type product, product with the seed suspended in that mulch. Uh, the mulch and the seed gets mixed together in a big tank with water, and then uh, that mixture will be applied. Again, the operator tends to know, um, you know, how, how quickly to walk and spread and how much product to apply per, per you know, unit, per meter, per, per acre. So uh, in a hydro seed tank, you will have sort of a, that bulking agent and tackifier, which is something that helps the seed stick to the site. And that's one of several different types of mulch slurry. But you can also add bulking agents if you are drop seeding, drill seeding, or hand seeding. And this is because uh, the reason that this might be a good idea is because um, the wildflower seed in particular is very, very small. It's very, very fine. And it can be difficult to spread something that small evenly and precisely um, without having more volume to handle. So one way to bulk up the volume is by mixing your seed, seed with either something inert, dead, like sawdust, sand, or perhaps uh, with a nurse crop, something like millet. If you don't actually want or need the function of the nurse crop, you can bake the millet. You can sort of kill the millet first, but then still use it as a really cheap um, bulking agent for your seed mix. And if you're using millet, you can use something like 10 times the rate of millet. It's very, very cheap. And then that will help you spread your seed more evenly. So in terms of uh, actual mass of a seed mix that you might consider using, uh, this is the method that was taught to me originally, not the seeds per meter, but the kilograms per hectare. Um, I think this is 
probably the more common way to specify seed mixes in southern Ontario, but it can be a little less precise um, in terms of controlling what your mix looks like and what species ratios you're putting out onto the landscape. Um, but in the past, I've worked with um, mixes as low as five kilograms per hectare. And these are mixes that have very low grass, very high wildflower component typically, and or the project is constrained by budget. Um, more often, I'm working with rates between seven and 12 kilograms per hectare, sometimes up to 15 um, kilograms per hectare. And if you're hydro seeding, um, some references do recommend that you double the rate that you would use drill seeding or drop seeding. So potentially if you're hydro seeding, you could consider up to 30 kilograms. I have seen more than that, believe it or not, <laughs> specified. I, I truly do believe that that is overkill. I think more than 15 or 20 is overkill. Um, but again, there is no one best recommended rate by any one um, sort of authority, uh, but this is just sort of the range that I would consider reasonable. Okay, and then within your total rate, um, you're probably wondering about your individual species rates. This is where the calculator really does come in and where prescribing seeds per meter is way more precise and um, handy in, in controlling, you know, how, how many seeds of each species you're going to see in your target assemblage. So we'll go through a calculator example in a moment. Um, you know, some people do suggest a cover crop. I would say unless erosion is an issue, a cover crop will more or less just be more competition for your system. Here are some photos of some roadsides that I restored and studied for four years as part of my PhD work. Um, so after about three years, you can get a successful, you know, direct seeded restoration should look something like this, dense with wildflowers. And um, I'm actually going to stop there because I'm talking too much. I apologize and switch screens. I'm going to go through the calculator real quick. Okay, can everybody see um, an Excel spreadsheet? Victoria, I hope so. Yes, we can see it. Perfect, thanks. There's thumbs okay. up, other people can too. Awesome. Okay, I'll try to zoom in as much as possible. Um, but like I said, on the left, you'll see your species list with a few different um, uh, descriptors for those species. The production rank is color-coded. I've color-coded a lot of things. Um, but just to show you some of the more difficult species to produce in bulk, things like bottle gentian, things like blue lupin, things like golden alexanders, um, things that are very easy to produce are things like sweet ox eye, Canada rye, riverbank rye, blue vervain, very easy to produce. Um, so I would base your mixes primarily on uh, species ranked one and two, perhaps. And if you want to consider species ranked three or four, I would certainly reach out to a couple of suppliers first to see if this is something that they can even grow. Um, and if you're working on a long-term restoration project, you may be able to provide some, you know, wild seed to be scaled up um, for bulk seed later on of some of these species. So that's the species list on the left. You can sort by plant type. You can sort any way you'd like, really. Um, so the calculator on the right is between the two black bars. And the example that I'm showing here is a super, super basic wet meadow mix that you might want um, to order. For example, you might want to get an idea of how, what's the total kilograms this would look like and what might the price be. So I've stuck with species that are, are really safe production rank one, that are either wetland forbs or mesic forbs. And um, this is just a total custom vision of, of the proportion of each species that I would like to see in that mix. So I've frozen the first pane so you can see. 
10% uh, Riverbank Rye, 10% Brown Eyed Susan, for example. Um, but you can change any of the proportions and so long as they add up to 100. I've got a little box there you can check. Um, so just make sure your proportions add up to 100. And the rate. So this is the other thing that you need to choose highlighted in red. So I've got uh, 250 seeds per meter. If you wanted to go down the lowest rate that I would recommend, just change all these 200 and that adjusts everything. And so this will give you your total number of kilograms per hectare. So at 100 seeds per meter, you're only looking at about four and a half kilograms per hectare, which is a little low. So you want to probably increase your rate. So we'll stick to the 250. Again, this is up to you based on your budget and based on the density that you want to see. But this now falls within um, the sort of traditional way of specking seed mixes, it falls between the seven and 12 kilograms. So I'm okay with that rate. And uh, like I said, at the very beginning, you just wanna make sure that the sum of this column is represented in every cell of this column, which it is, super. And this calculates everything else for you. So for that basic mix, wetland meadow mix at about 10.8 kilograms per hectare, looking at about $1,700, $1,800 per hectare, and the mix would be about $167 per kilogram. And I do want to just um, flag that the estimated cost is based on a very, very loose estimation of price per species that has been available um, on the market uh, from various suppliers over the last 10 years or so. And I've binned the prices just into really simple price points, $50, $100, $250, $500, and $1,000 per kilogram. And I will caution you to take this with a grain of salt. Um, definitely consult your suppliers about mix pricing and individual species pricing. But this is meant to just be a, a, a first step so you can see and, and budget accordingly uh, for your mix. So that that will be in the ballpark of about $167 per kilogram. Okay, so um, like I mentioned, this calculator also has a eco zone functionality. Um, we are still gathering feedback from regional experts as to what should be in these different eco zone mixes. Um, but then you would simply plug those mixes into your custom proportion, uh, sorry, those, those species ratios into your custom proportion and the calculator would calculate everything else for you. Uh, we do eventually also want to include data on flowering time um, and a few other things, but maybe that will come later. So for now, we're offering kind of this as a, uh, a, a, test, a test version one. Uh, I think we'll be able to send it out to folks who are on the call to play around with it, uh, provide some feedback. But with the last few minutes, I was just wondering if uh, we could now uh, go through some questions. Sorry, that took a little longer than I was hoping, but um, lots of details to go to, to cover. So. Thank you so much, Stefan. Yes, you're very thorough and I have learned so much and I am certain that um, those who've attended this uh, webinar today are going to look back at the recording and, and follow up and, and uh, do some relearning again. So we definitely have some questions on here and I also just want to um, share that we have the, the option to bring you to the stage if you want to ask a question um, over video or using your voice. So um, you can just you know, type a little note in the, the comments section and I can bring you to the stage. We are recording, so just keep that in mind that it'll be recorded. Um, so let's see here. One of the questions that we have is how can the lower producing plants be encouraged to grow, uh, encouraged in growth for pollinator gardens? So the species with the higher seed yields relate closer to invasive species and at times the lower yield plants perhaps need human intervention for their preservation? 
Yes. Um, so those plants are probably best dealt with in sort of an ex situ conservation garden setting if you wanted to produce seed specifically for their recovery, for a species species specific recovery. Um, but they tend not to be great for bulk seed habitat creation projects. And will a seed mix be more expensive if it contains a higher diversity of seeds from your experience? Sure. So um, price is really dependent on how easy that plant is to harvest, how large the seeds are, how many seeds are produced per plant. So um, something like soft stemmed rush or blue lobelia can be upwards of $1,000 per kilogram simply because they have really, really, really tiny fine seeds and it's hard to produce a large amount of them. Whereas something like big blue stem grass, it's very easy to farm and harvest large quantities and that will set the price. Um, so diversity can increase the price of your mix if you're working with hard to handle, a lot of different hard to handle wildflowers, yeah. Well, that makes sense. And uh, do irrigation solutions for dry zones to encourage the seed mixes rely on permaculture or agroforestry methods? Um, so watering helps. Uh, irrigation does help. Uh, it was found that if, if restorations experience a drought within their first three years, they will likely fail. Um, so if you can at all provide irrigation in the first year and or during drought years, definitely do that. Plants <laughs> plants like water more more often than not, um, but that can't that, that's not possible for every large-scale restoration. We have a question um, that's asking about harvesting seeds from milkweed plants uh, and whether or not there's any resources such as videos or websites to do that. Do you have any um, tips or advice on, on doing that? Yeah, it's a very fun one to do with a group of people. Um, so pick the pods when they're still green, but check them. They have to split open easily and the seeds should be brown, but pick them when they're green. And then you can just pop them all open. The seeds slide off really easy. If it's not possible and all of your pods are brown and the seeds starting to fluff out already, use a shop vac. So suck up all that fluff with seeds through a shop vac and the vortex, the spinning in the, in the shop vac tends to separate the seed and the fluff. Um, don't overload your shop vac. You might have to do it in a few stages, but that's a really easy way to clean your milkweed seed fast. That's a fantastic tip. I'm definitely going to keep that one in my back pocket. I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. And uh, a question that I have for you is, um, you talked a little bit about uh, storage of seed. How long would um, seed be viable if stored properly? So a lot of the orthodox species can be viable for hundreds plus years, um, dozens of dozens of years if kept cold around one, two, up to four degrees and dry, but not completely desiccated. So usually you get them to an optimal ratio of cold and humidity, and then you seal them up. And if you seal them like that, seed banks can keep them stored for hundreds of years. Um, generally, most wildflower seeds can be kept cold and dry or even at room temperature and dark for a couple years. Um, but if you can keep them dry in a veggie crisper or something, that's probably best. Perfect. That's good to know. And we have um, a, someone who's seeking some advice um, on whether or not others have had this experience and maybe Stephanie, you've had this experience, but um, regarding hydro seeding, some practitioners in Western National Parks have had success by broadcast seeding roadside sites, um, first followed by applying a uh, tacifer only, um, not the hydro mulch, which can be too thick. Um, it allows a lower seeding rate and cost. Is this something that you've ever experienced? Yeah, and I'm actually going to share my screen again. Um, so we, I studied this as part of my PhD. We called it a, a one and a two phase method. So the two phase method, we hand broadcast the seed first, and then the hydro seed slurry mulch was applied over top. Um, and so initially there was some interaction between rate and method in that a two seed uh, application, so the hand seed first, hydromulch over top um, 
was significantly higher when you were using a smaller amount of seed. So it was a more efficient way to, to sow a small amount of seed. However, if you just increase the amount of seed that you're using, it kind of makes up for that inefficiency. And so we got the same result with a one phase method at a high rate that we did with the two phase method at a high rate. And I also want to point out that over three years, the rate didn't make a difference in the community after three years. So the initial cover was different, but after three years, um, our carrying capacity, basically we hit carrying capacity and that dictated what the community was. I hope that made sense. <laughs> but that Holly, that's a great question. And uh, we can talk more about it later. If you want, please reach out to me. And um, just finally, um, we have someone just asking if you have um, your reasoning for a variety of seed sourcing, um, if you have that written anywhere that you can share. I'm going to go back and share my screen again, if you don't mind. Um, I did prepare some of these extra slides <laughs> just because I anticipated questions, I suppose. Um, so the figure I'm going to share with you, these are two great resources, uh, references. So one shows how admixture sourcing at the nursery to supply restoration material can provide more genetically diverse restoration plantings, which in a fragmented part of the world is really important. Uh, and then this other source on the right uh, gets into the benefits of admixture sourcing and proposes that about half of your material should come from a very local source. And then the rest of your, of your material should come from intermediate and even long distance sources to include as much genetic diversity as possible. Um, yeah, so you can, you can look up these papers. I can also follow up with a few links and things if that's possible. Um, I'll stop sharing. But yeah, there, there's quite a bit of um, research and, and stuff out there that supports admixture sourcing for restoration. That's fantastic. And yes, if you can share those uh, links, I'll be sure to include them in the recording of our webinar today. Um, and also uh, any other resources, um, including the, the C calculator to those who have joined. And CWF also has a, a little poster that we've developed on steps to get you started when considering purchasing your seed mix, thinking about your budget and so on. And that will be shared as well. And we are, are just at our time for ending today. Uh, so we will end things there. But like I said, we do have this recording that will be shared. So you can um, go back and, and do some relearning and, and um, follow up um, with anything that you, you might have um, maybe forgotten or would like to learn more about. And um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, feel free to send us an email. Um, I'll just pop uh, our email here in the chat. And um, Hopefully, Stefan, if you don't mind, if there's any questions that were about the presentation that uh, those didn't get to ask, if we can uh, check in with you if they, if they come up. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right. So thank you so much, Stefan. That was uh, really fantastic. I learned so much, and I know that others did here today. It's going to be a huge help as we continue um, in our restoration efforts. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today for taking the time um, and to learn. And I, I really wish you a wonderful field season. Thanks, everyone.